So now we, the main goal in this module is trying to understand what determines GDP, right? So we have spent two lectures to understand the determination of GDP from demand side, right? So basically what we have done is, so we just, we just leave the supply side as given and then just purely focus on demand side, right? And then the demand side is kind of summarized by this equation. Okay, let me write it down. So this equation, y equal to a plus mpc times y plus i plan. Okay, so this comes from, this is giving you c, right? c as a function of disposable income. But remember disposable income essentially is another way to look at the GDP. And this is, a per, this is a investment, but this plan, right? And then from this equation, because there's only one unknown, which is what, which is Y. So from this equation, you have only one known, you're gonna get Y, but remember, this is how we get Y from demand side. Okay, we just, we just leave, leave the supply side discussion as it is or just we should set aside the, the supply side. Now we are going to enter a new chapter. So it's, it's kind of what we did for microeconomics, right? In microeconomics, we started with demand and then we look at supply. When we look at demand, we take price as, as given. When we look at supply, we look at price as given, right? And then, so we bring them together. So that's going to tell you not only the equilibrium quantity, also the price. And similarly here, so we are going to bring demand and supply together and see how the price and the quantity are determined. And for, furthermore, one more thing before I move to the next slide. So here, when we look at, when I say demand, not only we take supply as given, furthermore, so we also take price as given or price, price is fixed for the moment, right? Because remember lots of two lectures, there was no discussion about price. Do you remember? Or in other words, you can look at this equation. Is the price in this equation? No, right? So their price wasn't there, right? But now the first thing we are gonna do, so let me erase. The first thing that we are gonna do here is again, so we are going to look at demand, that's gonna build upon what we discussed in previous two lectures, essentially aggregate expenditure function. And then, so first thing we are gonna introduce a price to finish the discussion of aggregate demand. After that, we are going to look at aggregate supply. Okay, once we just study the both side, we are going to the equilibrium. So that's how we proceed. All right. So now let's look at the root map. We look at demand but aggregate, supply and aggregate. And then so we are going to look at equilibrium. But now here there's a very important sense. So we are going to study short run and a long run equilibrium. And you're gonna see there's a significant difference. And more important in the short run, in the short run. So there's very interesting relationship between, let me write it down, in the short run. There's very interesting relationship between price levels and unemployment. But furthermore, that just means the supply, right? In the short run. But in the long run, as we are going to see later, in the long run, price level doesn't matter. But in the short run, price level matters. Like say, because right now, so we are in the inflation. In the short run, there's inflation. So means coming from out of this lecture, you're going to see, so this inflation has significant impact on our aggregate economy. This also just linked to the earlier picture I showed you. So I have, there was one picture shows uh, what the Fed is, 
what the, what the main goal for Fed was trying to strike a balance between the need of worker and the price stability. And then, so hopefully in this chapter, you can start to make sense why they are trying to uh, strike a balance. So two things, it seems like not relevant. Again, on the one hand is price stability. On the other hand is the demand for worker. But what is price stability? So essentially, so inflation is not too high, not too low. What is the need for worker? So essentially, they need good jobs, meaning unemployment rates low, right? But then you may wonder, so why they're trying to strike a balance with these two, and or more fundamentally, why these two are linked together? The answer is going to lie in this chapter. All right. Okay. So that's what we're going to study. So hopefully, toward the end of this this uh, chapter we are going to understand two big questions. Question number one, what caused recession? So think of 2008, 2009, great recession. Or 2020, so we have this uh, COVID-19 caused recession. Or even earlier, 1929, the Great Depression. What caused those troubles to our economy? Or you can see, okay, what causes the disease, this kind of like a disease to our economy, right? What caused them? So this is the first big question we are, we are going to answer. Second, why is inflation high in some recession and not other? Or in other words, why inflation kind of link with recession? Okay, so those are the two questions. Because why those questions are important? Because essentially, once we understand this two equation, we have a clear idea how the macro economy work. And then, so when the economy is in trouble, okay? So once we know the mechanism, and then so we, we know how to intervene. Or think about in, 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 in medical school. So it's kind of, okay, so you know how to treat the symptom. Right, so that's, that's why this is important. We are getting toward the heart of this class, right? Again, just remind you so we came a long way. We first studied measurement. We understand how to have accurate measure of our aggregate economy from different perspective, like GDP, price, uh, uh, labor market, right? Even long run growth, okay? And then so in this module, we are trying to understand so how these things are linked together. What determines price? What determines GDP? And then what causes the fluctuation? Because recession is just part of the fluctuation. And in particular, this is the part of the fluctuation we do not like, right? Because usually when recession comes, so the output decline, income decline, and unemployment rate goes up, right? So this is the part we don't like. But we need to understand why and how we get there so that we understand what we can do to help the economy. Okay. All right, so essentially we are going to look at the demand and supply as I mentioned in the inter inter introduction. Now let's start with aggregate demand. So this is our aggregate demand curve. So first, this curve looks pretty much the same as the individual demand, but its meaning is slightly different, number one. And second, the cost is slightly different. Now let's see what this means. Horizontal line is the real GDP. Okay, remember, like I said many times, so real GDP, so you have two, you have three ways to understand real GDP. One is total expenditure. Second is total income. Third is total product, final goods. And here, actually, so we look at expenditure or the demand. Okay. Vertical line, aggregate price level. Okay, this is not the price of a particular product. This is the price for the aggregate economy. 
And here you can see actually what we use is, is use GDP deflator. We study what is GDP deflator, right? So if you forgot, you just go back to the previous chapter to see what is defined as GDP deflator. Okay. Now each dot, say for example, this dot represent one year. These dots represent 1933. And in 1933, the US economy, so this is the real GDP. Again, so you may forgot what is real GDP. Just go back to the previous lecture to see what is real GDP. So real GDP is $716 billion. Okay. So just a kind of like remind you what is current real GDP and see so what make a difference. So right now the US GDP is close to 19 trillion. Okay, the real GDP is close to 19 trillion. So that's 20 times, right? About 20 times, more than 20 times compared to 1933, right, real GDP. This is total GDP, okay? Uh, okay, on the vertical line, this is the price level, 7.9. Now remember we used 2005 as a base year. Okay, make sure I understand what that means. All right. So this is basically just saying says from 1933, if we compare to 2005, the price price increased roughly like a 12 fold. All right. So in any case, okay, so this dog just tells us in a particular year what is the real GDP and what is the price level in this particular dog. Any other dots represent another year. And if we just connect those dots together, and usually we are going to fit with almost a perfect straight line. And this straight line is called aggregate demand. And this aggregate demand essentially just tells us how the aggregate demand or the total GDP, remember, like I wrote, so there are three ways to look at GDP. Right, expenditure, what, how the aggregate expenditure respond to the aggregate price. And it clearly there's a similar pattern, law of demand, higher the price, lower the aggregate demand. Lower the price, higher the aggregate demand. Or in other words, currently we are in a, we have high inflation. Meaning what? Do we have high price or low price? Aggregate price, high price. And what would you expect aggregate demand? Look at it here. With high price, what would be the demand? Low, actually no. But why? Just, just think about your daily decision. Because the price is high, so your demand to goods, is as usually strong or weak. Just think about yourself. You have a lower incentive to purchase or higher incentive to purchase compared to like two or three years ago. Lower. And why is lower? But as that's going to kind of go to the next slide. Why your incentive to demand or to purchase is lower compared to two or three years ago when the price level is lower? Why? Just think intuitively or think use a common sense. Or you cannot spend, to, right? So because you don't have the purchasing power, right? So that's one reason. So actually there are two reasons, okay? So the the two reasons, yeah, by the way, so this is, this is how they, uh, this is what we call the law of demand. If price level goes down, the aggregate demand will increase, right? And that's called movement along the curve. The cause of this movement along the curve is because the aggregate price level, right? Well, in other words, right now, so the price level is, is going up and meaning we are going to move to the left, upper left. Does that make sense? Okay. To understand what determines the shape, or what determines this accurate demand curve, we must go back to this original equation. We have studied several times, right? So this equation just tells you, we look at the GDP through the lens of expenditure. Okay. 
Now, why a rise in aggregate price level? Why if this increase is going to reduce those things? There are two reasons. Reason number one, wealth effect. The higher aggregate price level reduce your purchasing power. Let's say, for example, if every month you make $2,000, the price level increase. Okay, let's just make the calculation simple. Say, for example, the price doubles. Okay, how would your purchasing power be affected? You make two thousand dollars per month. Price level doubles. How will you purchase in power? Means how many goods you can you can you can purchase? The same amount or less? Less, right? So that just means okay. So even though you still want to buy, but you can only afford less. So that's going to imply demand increase. So this is the number one. Number two. We call interest rate effect. Okay, so when price level rise, and usually the households needs hold more money, so that to facilitate the transaction. If that's the case, and then you have less money, you can set aside as saving or investment. Or in other words, you don't have as much cash as you used to be, so that you can invest in big ticket items or invest in stocks or other financial assets. That just means the investment is going to decline. All right, so there are two effects, wealth effect and interest rate effect. So this, these two effects will bring down aggregate demand when the price level goes up. All right, so now, we are going to go back to the aggregate expenditure equation or function we studied in previous chapter. So that's kind of give you a connection with what we studied and what we just saw in terms of aggregate demand, okay? So this is a diagram we are very familiar with, right? So again, so this aggregate expenditure plan. So this is coming from where? Coming from A plus MPC times Y plus I plan, right? And as I just said in today's introduction, so this line is for given price level, right? As a matter of fact, in previous lecture, we even did not talk about price level at all. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Now, what happened if the price level goes down? What happened to this aggregate expenditure function? Just link to the slide what we just discussed. What happened? These lines go up or go down? Go up, right. Why did it go up? Price went down, right. So because the price went down and then so the wealth effect and interest effect, right? So C and I will go up, okay? So the curve or the line, will go up. Now, if this line go up, what happened to the GDP or the aggregate demand? Increases, exactly. Actually, the GDP increased from Y1 to Y2. How we read that? So this is the equilibrium GDP at the original price level. And this E2 is uh, equilibrium GDP at the new price level, all right? So how we end up these two essentially coming from what we discussed in previous lecture, because you know this aggregate expenditure function and you have 45 degree line, they cross each other and it gives you the aggregate demand. And why you have these two dots is because there are two different price levels, right? And why the price level change caused the aggregate expenditure function move to a particular direction? That is coming from previous slides, income effect, sorry, uh, wealth effect and the interest rate effect. 
right? Okay, but but from the discussion of these slides, what do we learn? We learn price decline in price y d increase, right? So that explains so why the curve is downward slope. But we have another better way to see that. We have better way to see that. So on the top, this is what we are familiar with from previous lecture, right? On the top is what we discussed in previous lecture, real GDP on the horizontal line, plan aggregate spending on vertical line. As I just said, this is for given price level, right? You have the one dot, or it just corresponds to the bottom line. So this given a particular price level, you're going to find out why. Okay. Now, if we look at a different price level, okay, say for example, if we look at price level P2, and then the, from the previous discussion, we knew this line will move up. And the cross 45 degree line, the higher level, meaning so once the price move from P1 to P2, we are gonna see a new aggregate demand. So that is how we, how we connect what we discussed in previous chapter to this new chapter. How we derive the aggregate demand curve from this essentially is the Keynesian cross, right? That's what we discussed in the previous chapter, right? So it's called a Keynesian cross. The top figure is called a Keynes cross. Right? So this is how two chapters are connected. The only difference or the only change we made is one. We introduced price. We look at how the economy is going to respond at a different price level. But so far, we only focus on the demand side. Okay, and just use your common sense, right? So right now, so the price level is quite high. There's inflation. We talk about inflation every day, right? So you can easily see there, from like say, a gas 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 station, or you just go to Target, wherever, right? And then, so naturally, how you're going to respond? You're going to respond and cut your spending or purchase less either voluntarily or involuntary. Vol involuntarily means you just cannot afford. Voluntarily means you just want to save or you don't want to spend too much, right? Okay, so this is how we get the aggregate demand. Now let's see what happened or what can cause this aggregate demand curve to shift. So this is pretty much similar to uh, the micro level, okay? So the aggregate demand curve shift, and it can be caused by the following reasons. It can be an expectation. The first, let me list those things, and then we go one by one. Expectation, wealth, size of the existing stock of physical capital, and the government policy. Okay, so, what kind of expectation can cause the demand curve shift? By the way, so the curve shift, let me just go to the curve and then see what this means. If the curve shifts to the right, meaning the aggregate demand increase, how do you understand that? So that just says, if price level is fixed, the same price level, you're gonna demand more. Does it make sense? Similarly, if the same level, of demand, you willing to pay or you can tolerate higher price. So that means, okay, so even though iPhone 40 increased from like the last year's 900 to 1200, you still purchase the same amount. That just means your demand for iPhone is increased. Does that make sense? Well, on the other hand, so if, if the price of iPhone decreased from nine, uh, 1200 to 900, you're willing to like uh, to upgrade every year instead of one year, uh, every two other year. So that's the increase in demand. So here I just give you a uh, example for so I use uh, 
use a particular commodity as example, but this is for aggregate economy, the same logic. On the other hand, if the curve shifts to the left, means the demand, the aggregate demand is decreasing. Now we need to understand what can cause the curve shift to the left and shift to the right. Okay, so this is going to be very useful because that's going to help us understand later. You're going to see so either the demand or supply move, you're going to see the price and the quantity is going to change. Okay, but we need to look at the moving part one by one. So now, now let's focus on the first one. What kind of expectation do you think that it can cause the curve to shift, either to the right or to the left? Let me give you an example, and, 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 and you tell me. So if we are expecting after the midterm election, it's coming soon, the government is going to take the right decision. And then the economy is going to boom in. There are plenty of jobs and the inflation is going to be 10. So what is your expenditure will look like? Increase or decrease? Let me say it again. So if you're expecting, so the economy is getting better and better, you're going to increase the spend. You have confidence, right? On the other hand, on the other hand, so let's say, for example, so you were very worried about the winter, okay? And so for example, so the uh, Russia invasion of Ukraine is going to ripple through to United States because of the winter, so the energy price, stuff like that. And how would your spending will look like? You increase or decrease? Decrease, right? So that's how expectation is going to play through the aggregate demand. If we are optimistic about future, we increase the spending. If we are pessimistic about future, we decrease our spending, right? So this is the first one. Now go back to the factor. So this check, right? Okay. But certainly there are other expectations. Right? So here just give you the most relevant. Second one, wealth. Now wealth is kind of subtle. Okay, let's just first give you examples, easier to understand. Now, just imagine the stock market crashed after midterm election. How would that affect the aggregate expenditure? Decrease, why? You don't have much money to spend, right? Or at least like psychologically, you don't have money to spend, right? But certainly some might may argue, okay, so why would that matter to me? Because I don't have stocks. How you defend that argument? You, yeah, ask, ask the class. If you have answer, you tell me. Is the question clear? Let me say it again, okay? So you're right. So if we expecting, or if, the stock market collapse and certainly so the aggregate demand is going to decrease right but then someone may argue why would that matter because i don't have stocks the stock market collapse or uh, or boom it doesn't matter to me why would that matter to aggregate demand and how would you answer that question how would you answer that argument anyone Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. So that's a great answer, but it's, yes, you have. So that is, there's certainly that's a great answer. So you are saying, so it's like a crash in the stock market is going to ripple through to the uh, uh, aggregate problem. That's, that's a very um, good answer, but we even don't need to go that far, but certainly that's a very good answer. But, it, but it, the easy way to defend that is, remember we talk about aggregate demand, okay? Yes, that's true. Not everyone has a position in stock market, but we are talking about aggregate. So as a matter of fact, in the United States, 60 to 70% of people has position in stock market. So that's, that's already a big number. 
Right, but certainly what you said is, 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 is even better answer, right? To summarize, to summarize, we look at the aggregate, okay? It's not necessarily everyone is gonna affect directly, but the aggregate economy is gonna affect directly, okay? So this is the second one. Third, size of the existing stock of physical capital. To understand that, let's use restaurant as an example. If the restaurant has plenty of physical capital unused, meaning so most of the time their table is stuck around or not, it's open. What does that mean to aggregate demand? Or what does that mean if, the, if, if, if a restaurant, so their capital, there's uh, there's physical capital are not used. I'm sorry, the demand is low, right? So that essentially just means aggregate demand is low. And furthermore, do you think the restaurant has the incentive to invest further in physical? No, right? So by looking at physical capital, we kind of know so what's the demand and how the direction of the demand goes. This also kind of links to the earlier discussion we had regarding to the inventory investment. All right, so this is the third one, check. Now the last two, so we haven't talked about anything about the government yet, but this is something we are gonna extensively discuss after this module. First, physical policy. What is physical policy? So government change tax or spending, so that affects demand. What is monetary policy? The government changes money supply to affect demand. Okay, from the definition I gave to you, you probably already see how these things can affect the aggregate demand. Because by design, physical policy and the monetary policy are government policy designed to change aggregate demand. But at this point, you may or may not have the question in your mind but you should have a question in mind. Why the government won't change aggregate demand? You need to keep that question in mind. Why the government has policies that was exclusively designed to change aggregate demand, either physical policy or monetary policy. Give you an example. What is physical policy? 2020, 2021, United States, most European country, Japan, and even many developing countries, they send out mass amount of money to the household, right? In the United States, so pretty much everyone in your family receive a free check, right? What, what happened in Japan? You have a similar thing. How big is the check? So tell me again, I'm fine, so. Hundred thousand yen, so that's like thousand US dollar or less, like seven. Right now, because the yen, so the exchange rate is like hundred seventy, right? Right? Okay, but then like uh, when they sent out it was like hundred twenty or something, right? Because recently the yen is like depreciated a lot, but it's roughly in order of close to one thousand, right? So that is the example of physical policy. Okay, and then so you should keep in mind, we are going to, we are coming back to this again. You keep in mind why the government want to do that. Or in general, why the government has policy designed to change aggregate demand. Right, but certainly, so this uh, 100,000 yen, or in US, so the end, so probably each of us, on average, we receive like a two or 3,000 US dollars. How would that affect aggregate demand, by the way? Go up, right? Okay, so certainly you can see the physical policy has impact, has impact on aggregate demand. But what is the monetary policy? Monetary policy is like right now, they raise the interest rate. But then so naturally it's going to affect what? Mortgage. And then so the demand for house is going to what? Decline. Right, because it's more expensive, like I mentioned earlier. 
right? So it's more expensive to borrow and you cannot afford to buy the house you would like to have, right? Okay, so this is monetary policy. But again, so we are going to, but, uh, but we are going to discuss that in later chapter in more details, right? So those are the things can affect aggregate demand. Make sure you understand each of them and in particular in the future, you can spot or you can identify, you can identify which channel is that? Is through expectation or through wealth or through current policy and in which direction? Yes. Physical capital. So the, the, the example is, maybe let me use another example, okay? Think about the iPhone or Apple. If they have lots of inventory, do they, do you think the app, the, do you think the uh, Apple company is going to invest more or invest less? Why? That's a good answer, why? If they have lots of iPhone could not, could not sell, and then your answer is, yeah, they are going to cut their investment spending. That's the correct answer, yes. So naturally, it's why, yes. Right. Or in other words, so that's a perfect answer. Basically, it says, okay, they already overproduce, right? So they want to shrink. The only way to shrink is to reduce the investment. But remember, investment is goes to where? Goes to part of the aggregate expenditure. Anyways, okay. So an investment part of the aggregate expenditure, right? Does that, that answer your question? Okay, so here I just give you examples, right? These two examples just tells you how the physical capital, the stock of physical capital can change the calculation. But usually it's like through a signal. Actually, as a matter of fact, everything is through a signal, right? Expectation is a signal to us. Oh, so we must save or we must, we have lots of to consume. Physical capital also is a, is a signal, right? So suddenly you have more money in your, your bank, right? So we have, we have seen this, right? So the left or the right, that just tells you increase or decrease. Now, let's just back to one of the things that I mentioned earlier, it need to be tricky. Changing wells, it can cause a move along the curve, or, and it can also change, cause a shift. It depends. It depends. Why? So here, here is the thing. If, if your wills change is purely caused by changing price level, okay? If that's the only factor, and then, so we are going to move along the curve. Right? So, for example, so inflation, like what, what we are experiencing now, rapid inflation shrink our wealth. Okay? But on the other hand, if changing wealth caused by something else, and then that's going to be shift in aggregate demand. So, for example, a housing market crash. Right? So you can tell the difference, right? So both end up with change our wills, but the cost is different. But however, here, so this is some more subtle issues. Rising inflation usually not only causes a move around the curve, it usually can also cause a shift of the curve. Why? It's because, so there's two parts. One part is immediately there's inflation. And the other part is usually psychologically, you are expect you are expecting there's inflation down the road. Does that make sense? So there are two parts. One part is immediately there's inflation. You change your wealth, you move along. There's a price change. But also usually it's come with a further price rise in the future. So that's going to move the curve. Is that clear? All right. 
So now it looks like, let's look at this practice question. Two steps. Step number one, we identify which aspect is going to affect it, like expectation, wells, or other things. Step number two, you need to identify which direction. Here, there's a realistic market collapse, essentially a housing market collapse. And your wells is going to decline. Because in the US, again, like 60, 70% of people own a house. Right, and then your wealth collapse. So that's a negative impact on your demand. Aggregate demand is going to decrease. Goes to the left hand side, right? Thank you. So aggregate. Oh, by the way, so SRAS stands for short run aggregate supply. This is what we're going to discuss in the following slides. So this is kind of linked to what we just mentioned, right? So sometimes, most of the time, it's hard to differentiate between a shift and a move, right? All right, let's skip that. So by the way, so 1979, that's the time period. So when US economy experienced a high inflation, this is kind of we are experiencing now, right? Okay, so now we move to aggregate supply okay so the discussion very similar but the mechanism or the economics behind the aggregate supply is quite different from aggregate demand okay. first of all this is how the aggregate supply curve will look like okay so each dot represent a particular year right now on the horizontal line we still we have real GDP. But remember, we look at real GDP through three perspectives. One is expenditure. Second is income. Third is product. When we study aggregate demand, we focus on expenditure. Now we focus on product. That's just supply. Right. So here just says, okay, is price level is, is it said 9.9 .9 in 1929. The real GDP is about 1 trillion in 1929. Okay. And then we can look at another point. Say, for example, 1933. That's just, that's just during the Great Depression. Price level declined. The GDP also shrink. Now, so this is usually how the aggregate supply look like. Higher the price, remember this aggregate price level, higher aggregate price level, usually implied higher real GDP. Now we need to understand why. And furthermore, I want to emphasize this happened in short run. What does short run mean? And here, the simple way to understand that is short run, it means like a few months or in a year. But later I'm gonna give you more detailed explanation. Okay, short run. So this aggregate supply is for short run. Now we need to understand why there's an upward trend. Why higher price leads to higher aggregate supply, right? The answer lies to a very important observation of our economy. Okay, so this rising aggregate supply largely caused by stickiness of nominal wage. Okay, so what does this mean? And what does sticky wage mean? To help you understand that, so let me, I need a run here. Does anyone has a part-time or full-time job besides who you have a job? Where do you work? IV. So have you done, you do like part-time or full-time? Like how many hours you work? 
20. So when when did you start working for High V? Year half ago. Very good. So when you start work for High V, do you have a contract with High V? Verbal? Kind of. And so you agree to so work for them. Uh, so what is what's uh, so you you don't need to tell us. Just say okay. So but you 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 and Hivey you guys agree. So there's a hourly rate for your work, right? And if, lots of questions. So this agreement or this rate is fixed or change on a daily basis. So in other words, so both sides has agreement. So this salary is good for at least six months. Yes or no? What is the practice? Does anyone has another situation says, okay, my wage rate is gonna change every day? Yes? I serve. So that's different, serve? Yes, you have tips, right? But still your base salary is fixed, right? Okay, do, 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 do we have other experience? But okay, so just commit correctly if I'm wrong. So usually if you work for someone, the base salary or the wage rate is fixed. It's fixed for at least six months and even longer. Does it make sense? So that's what we mean, sticky wage. Meaning, so this wage is not easy to adjust. Okay, and you may wondering, so why? They have such arrangement. But we can have the conversation later, okay? But usually this comes from microeconomics. Certainly there's a cost. If the wages fluctuate on a daily basis, right? Okay, but we agree. So this is how it happens. Now, okay, so this is the beginning of our story. Okay, in the, so basically it just means in the short run or in other words, in six months, the wage rate won't change. We, 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 we agree, right? Okay, that's the starting point. Just imagine, there's a rising or rapid inflation. Actually, this is happening now, okay? So the inflation means price level rise, okay? But your wage rate won't adjust. Now let's just forget about yourself for, for a while. Let's just excuse me. Now let's focus on the employer. What does that mean to employer when there is rapid inflation and the wage rate doesn't change? What does that mean to employer? Can anyone tell me? What does that mean to employer or whoever hires you? Let's just pretend, okay, so they pay you $10 per hour. And so now there's inflation. Inflation is like 10 or 20%. In the short run, what does that mean to employer? Yes. Employer? No, I'm asking employer. So you always think about employee, the worker, right? I'm thinking about your boss or the owner. So if you give them high V, what does that mean to high V or what does that mean to the restaurant? I'm sorry? They have more money, why? That's a good answer. So why did they make more money? Exactly, so yeah, you guys are very smart, yes. So right, so in the nominal term, they pay you the same, right? But in the real term, they pay you less. Or in other words, if we look at a nominal term, so maybe we can write an equation, okay? For typical business, so what they care is their profit, right? So you, we use, you should use pie. And the profit comes from where? It comes from revenue, right? Revenue. And a minus cost. And usually, so there are two costs, right? One is a wage. The other is expense like material, right? Let's just, just simplify to save the expense, right? Okay, so now when there's inflation, these things are going to rise because they are going to charge higher price. Expenses also is going to write, that's fine. But the wage is fixed. And then they are going to have, they're going to collect more profit, right? In the short run, 
Now, if they are going to collect more profit, what would be their incentive in terms of hiring in the short run? Just forget about okay, whether they can hire or not, okay? Just in the short run, do they want to expand, hire more or hire less? Hire more, right? Because the more they hire, the more revenue they can generate, the more profit they can generate. And in the short run, they still pay you $10 per hour, right? So that expands. So why in the short run, higher the price means what? In terms of aggregate supply. It's go up, right? Why is through this channel, right? Through higher inflation brings you more profit. Why higher inflation brings you more profit? Because you pay the same wage before inflation happened. But remember, this is in short run. Now imagine these things keep moving. What are you gonna do? Did you do anything for your job? I'm asking you, yes. Yeah. So like, so, so they pay you the same wage, you know? Or they raise the wage, right? Okay, so if, just imagine, so if they did not raise your wage, are you gonna do something or are you gonna suck it up? You leave, right? So that's the rational behavior, right? So you leave. Or before you leave, usually you're probably just going to talk to your manager, right? Your manager has two options, it says, no, I cannot. Or they say, okay, I'm gonna raise. If they raise, what happens? Look at the equation. If they raise means what? So, and then it's over the longer term the wage is going to adjust. In the short term, so pretty much buying, right? Or it is like a, like a good phase. You don't want to, you don't want to like change too frequent, right? But in the over long term, so you feel squeezed. $10 before you can buy a hamburger, but now you can only buy half, just exaggerate. You, you, you're not happy. And then, so that either, so you quit, you find another job, or they keep you, just pay you higher, so in either case, what that means to their profit. It went up in orig originally and now it will go down. It's gonna to fall, to uh, fall to the earth, fall on the earth, right? And then, so what happened to the supply or their incentive to hire over time? It's gonna decline. Or in other words, it's gonna to return to the ground zero. So that is expand. So this relationship, as we saw, apply, applies in short term. And why it applies in short term is because in the short term, for many reasons, wage is sticky. But over long term, and the wage becomes flexible. And why it becomes flexible? Many reasons. One reason we can think about is, so the workers start to negotiate. Right? Okay, there are many reasons, okay? But clearly, okay, to summarize, so the short run aggregate supply is upward slope line. And the reason why it's upward slope is because in the short run, wage is sticky. But over the long term, wage is gonna be flexibly adjust the current economic situation. And then there's nothing you can profit from in terms of price. And that also expands. So in the long run, in the long run, the aggregate supply is going to be independent of price level. Whether we have inflation or not, in the long run, it just doesn't matter. How much we can produce is not going to depend on price. It's going to depend on something else. But again, of course, okay, so if you just, if our economy keep having crazy inflation, that's going to change the foundation of our economy. That's a different story. We, I'm here, we're just talking about something like a mild inflation, like a few percentage, like 10%. Okay, that's not going to enter the equation in terms of how much we are going to produce in the long run. But it matters in the short run. All right. So now, so we can just look at those definitions, kind of finish our discussion in this topic.
nominal wage is a dollar amount of the wage paid, right? Sticky wage, it just says nominal wage slow to fall or to rise when price change, right? So this sticky wage. And then so here, just replay what I just explained to you. Profit per unit equal to price per unit minus cost per unit. But this cost includes wage and other expense, like the materials, right? Or administrative costs, okay? And because nominal wage are binding in the short term, so the price rise, and then they are going to bring more profit. More profit, you're going to hire more. The more you hire, the more you're going to produce, right? So that's why we have this upward slope trend, okay? And furthermore, to close this part, furthermore, in reality, in reality, okay, not only the wage is sticking, okay, not only wage is sticking, and even worse, in reality, firms, they are, they are very competitive. I mean, sorry, uh, but in, even worse, in reality, in some industry, firms, they have monopoly power. Give you an example, Apple. Right? Meaning, okay, so if the inflation rise, inflation, if there's inflation, okay? So they, they may even charge a higher price because they knew so the demand is strong. If it is a competitive market, they may not be able to do that. But like because, of, because it's a monopoly or, the, or like a duopoly or like a few firms, they have market power. They are going to raise the price, meaning they're going to push up their profit even further. So that's going to make the aggregate demand curve even steeper. Right? Let's go back here. Just means, just means, so if there's inflation, not only the production cost is kind of flat, the price per unit is going to rise in further because they have the ability to charge higher price, but maintain the demand. So that's going to make the profit rise further. That's going to make the aggregate supply curve even steeper. But in any way, so that means, so we have plenty of justification to show the aggregate supply in the short run is upward. Okay. And similarly, so we are gonna look at the shift aggregate supply. Let's just first look at how that works. If the curve shift to the, let's say left, what this means? This means there's a decline. How we understand that? Two ways, right? It, given the same price, the firm is gonna willing to produce less. Or, Given the quantity, the firm is going to charge higher price, right? They're willing to, pro to supply, it's going to decrease. And obviously to that, if the curve shifts to the right, means there's an increase in aggregate supply. All right? And then, so next we're going to study what can cause, what can cause change in aggregate supply. But remember, this is short run aggregate supply, okay? There are three factors, there are three factors. So those three factors can change short run aggregate supply, okay? So I'm gonna stop here for today and we pick up next time.